We've already looked at the dot product of two vectors in R2 or two vectors in R3 or for that matter two vectors in Rn. The dot product of two vectors gives you back a number and you can do that in any number of dimensions. In this section of the book we're going to look at something very different, the cross product. It's something that exists only in R3, although you can do some generalizations of it to higher dimensions really. The cross product is a, something in R3. You take two vectors in R3, you take their cross product, and you get back another vector. It's uh, very different from the dot product, um, which gives you back a scalar. The cross product of two vectors is another vector. The cross product is an unusual algebraic operation. It is not commutative. It is not associative. It does um, distribute over addition, and you can pull scalars out. So it's, it's called linear if you fix one factor, and bilinear if you're referring to both of them. But in general, cross product is, in, uh, is an interesting operation. It's, it's different from anything you've probably seen before, unless you've seen the cross product. Um, it's, uh, first, there's the definition, which is a little odd. Uh, we have to define determinants of at least 2 by 2 and 3 by 3 matrices. We don't have to, but it's too complicated to memorize the formula for the cross product without doing that. So we're first going to look at determinants of 2 by 2 matrices and 3 by 3 matrices. First, I have to tell you what a matrix is. And after we've defined the cross product in terms of determinants, the question will be, why would anybody want to do that? What does it give you that's interesting? What applications are there, are there of the cross product? And we'll look at that too. But first, we have to start with matrices. So a matrix, matrices is the plural of matrix. A matrix, it's just a, a rectangular collection of numbers. It's easiest just to give an example. So something like 2, 3, the square root of 7, minus 1, 0, E. So this is a, a real matrix. All of its entries, all the numbers that you see are real numbers. Um, this one has two rows. Rows go horizontally and three columns. Columns go vertically. If you have trouble remembering that, think columns of a building go vertically and rows would be the other things. Um, so this is two rows. This has two rows, three columns. The numbers that you see are called the entries of the matrix. Um, when you're specifying the size of a matrix, you say how many rows there are first and then how many columns. So we would call this a two by three matrix. A two by three matrix. And if you really have to specify that it has real numbers in it, a two by three real matrix. We won't look at complex matrices, but you could. Matrices with complex numbers in them. All right. Um, a square matrix. A square matrix is just a matrix with the same number of rows and columns. So a square matrix. Has the same number of rows and columns. So a one by one matrix, which really just looks like a real number, but you put it in brackets. So one by one matrix, so this is one by one. You could have a two by two matrix. I've switched to using all variable names for my entries, a two by two matrix. That's square, two rows, two columns, and three by three, which is the biggest we're going to look at today. A three by three matrix. Okay, we need something called the determinant of a matrix. And the determinant of a square matrix, it's something you only do for square matrices. It's a real number associated to the matrix. Let's call this the square matrix something. How about A? 
is an important real number. So it's a single number associated to the matrix. If you take a course in linear algebra, you'll see lots of reasons why the determinant's important. We're going to use it for one specific thing, that's to calculate the cross product. Um, notation for the determinant, you either write a DET in front of your matrix, short for determinant, or we use what look like absolute value signs, really vertical lines are overused throughout mathematics. But yeah, we denote the determinant by either DET of A or putting horizontal lines around it. If you actually have to take the absolute value of the determinant, you don't want to use the vertical lines to denote the determinant. That would just be too confusing. All right, so what is the determinant? I'm not going to define the determinant for you in general, but I'm going to define it for you for one by one matrices, which is kind of silly two by two matrices and three by three matrices. The, um, there is an inductive definition of determinant. There are several different um, equivalent definitions of determinant, but we're not going to give the general one. So suppose you have a one by one matrix. So it contains a single entry. Then the determinant of that matrix is just the only entry that's there. Phew, that was tough. What about the two by two case? How do you define the determinant of a two by two matrix? So, actually, I'll skip this. How do you define the determinant of a two by two matrix? All right, it is, you take the product of the entries on this diagonal. This diagonal from the upper left to the lower right is usually called the main diagonal. You take the product of those entries and you subtract the product of the entries on the other diagonal. So it's AD minus BC. I want to mention another way of describing that. Yeah, that's what you do. You take the product of the entries on this diagonal and subtract the product on those. But because it will be analogous to how we'll do the three by three case, I want to state this in another way. What's another way you could think about taking, of producing that number that I've already said is the determinant? Well, you could look at this first row and start with the first entry in the first row and delete the row and column containing that and you're left with just the single entry D. So you take the entry A and you multiply it by the determinant of the one by one matrix you get if you delete the row and column containing A. Now this is kind of silly in this case because you take a times the determinant of just the matrix containing D. And then you move to this entry, and the sign alternates from a plus to a minus, and so now you subtract, and it's the entry B minus the determinant of the one by one matrix that you get if you delete the row and column containing B. But that's the matrix that just contains C. But of course, the determinant of this matrix is just D, and the determinant but that matrix is just C, so of course you get AD minus BC. <clears throat> Why describe it in that bizarre way? Because that's what you do for three, or what one of the things you can do for three by three matrices. So what's the determinant of a three by three matrix? You do not want to memorize the final formula. You want to memorize the method by which you produce the answer, not the answer written out in its pure algebraic form. So what is the determinant of a three by three matrix? There are different ways to do it, but we're going to do one. Which, what we're doing is called cofactor expansions across the, the first row. So you start with the first entry of the first row, and you multiply that. Maybe I'll move to the switch to the straight line notation for determinants, so we can get used to that, and it'll save me writing some stuff in a minute. So that means take the determinant of the matrix. You don't write the brackets also. The brackets are replaced by the vertical lines. 
So you delete, so you start with A, you delete the row and column containing A, that leaves you with a two by two matrix, and you multiply by its determinant. And then you move to the next entry in this row, so you move to B, and the sign alternates from a plus to a minus, so you subtract B times a two by two determinant. Which one? The one you get if you delete the row and the column containing B. That leaves you with D, F, G, I. Then you move to the last entry in the first row, C, and the sign alternates back to a plus. You add C times a two by two determinant, and that one is the one you get by deleting the row and column containing C. So you get D, E, G, H. But now, because you know how to take determinants of two by two matrices, you can expand all that and get what the cross product is. Now, there's no real point to doing this with the letters in it. You should absolutely not memorize this. Um, I'll write it just so you can see it once, but do, you know, memorize the method. You know, know what a two by two determinant means, and then know how you get it from three by threes to two by twos, or how you use two by twos to get three by three determinants. It's e times i minus f times h minus b times d times i minus f times g plus c times d times h minus e times g. Now, you don't want to memorize that. And then you can multiply all that out if you really want. Um, don't do that. Just, just remember how you get it. It's not that difficult. Let's do an example with some numbers in it, just so we can practice. So, example, we want to find the determinant of 2, 3, the matrix 2, 3, 5, minus 1, 0, 4, 7, 1, 6. All right. How bad is this? It's not bad at all. You just start with this first row, and then you, you're going to move down this first row. You start with the 2. And you get two times the two by, term, two by two determinant you get if you delete the row and column containing the two. So 0, 4, 1, 6. The sign alternates to a minus, and you subtract three times the two by two determinant you get if you delete the row and column containing three. So you get minus 1, 4, 7, 6. Then you move to the 5, your sign alternates back to a plus, and you get 5 times the 2 by 2 determinant that you get if you delete the row and column containing the 5. So minus 1, 0, 7, 1. And then you expand these 2 by 2 determinants. You get 2 times, and then it's this times this, well that's 0, minus this times this, so minus 4. Minus 3 times. Then it's this times this, so minus 6, minus this times this, so minus 28, plus 5 times this times this, so minus 1, uh, minus this times this, so 0. And then you multiply this out, you get whatever you get. I don't really care at this point, but I'll do it. This is minus 34 times minus 3, so plus 102 minus 5, so 102 minus 13, 89. What that 89 is telling you, well, you, know, you might need to take a linear algebra course, but we're going to apply this to the cross product. So, now that we have 3 by 3 determinants, we can define the cross product, except we cheat a little bit. We've defined 3 by 3 determinants, and uh, so matrix, we take a matrix with three rows and three columns of, well, up to now, real numbers. But now I'm going to cheat and put i, j, and k, the standard basis vectors for our three, in the top row. So it's not a real matrix any longer. It'll have two rows of scalars and a row of vectors, but the process is the same. So how do you define how do you define the cross product of two vectors in R3? Suppose, so the definition, so 
suppose v is a vector d1, d2, d3, and w is w1, w2, w3, then the cross product. V cross W. And that's how you read it. V cross W. Not V times W, because people wouldn't know whether you meant dot product or what. V cross W is defined to be and then it's the determinant of the 3 by 3 matrix that has i, j, and k across the top and then the components of the first vector and then the components of the second vector. So it's defined to be this cross product. What uh, so it's defined to be this determinant. What does that mean? It means, all right, you start with i, you delete the row and column containing i, and you take the 2 by 2 determinant that's left, v2, v3, w2, w3, and that's multiplied times i. You move to the j, and the sign alternates to a minus, and you get the 2 by 2 matrix. If you delete the row and column containing j, you get v1, v3, w1, w3, times j. You move to the k, and you take the 2 by 2 determinants you get by deleting the row and column containing k. So you get v1, v2, w1, w2, times k. So without determinants, you could define the cross product of the two vectors. You could just get, take our final result and define it that way. We get v2, w3, minus v3, w2, times i, so that's the first component, minus, and then it's v1, w3, minus, uh, okay, now it's, I've already included this minus here, so it's v1, w3, now minus, v3w1 minus that whole quantity and then plus v1w2 minus v2w1. Should you memorize that? No, you should do it in terms of determinants of 3 by 3 matrices. It's easier to remember and then you also know how to take determinants of matrices when you get to linear algebra. Why you would want to do this, we will get to it. But this is the definition of the cross product of two vectors in R3. You get back a vector in R3. It, it sort of looks like a completely stupid operation, um, but it's not. I should, while well, I'm erasing the board, let me emphasize that the, when you calculate V cross W, V goes in the second row. The components of V goes in the second row. Components of V go, of W go in the third row. It's important. The order matters. It would change the answer. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So, um, but let's do an, a quick example. I'm going to do one of these, but it's important that you know that all of them are true. If you take the basis vectors themselves, i, j, and k, what happens if you cross them with each other? So what's i cross j? Well, we're going to see that that's k, but I'll go ahead and tell you. Well, let me go ahead and write it. And then j cross k is i, and k cross i is j. How do you verify this? You just do it. So for instance, how do you show this first one? Well. I cross J, you take the 3 by 3 determinant, you put I, J, K here. You put the components of the first vector in the cross product here. So you get 1, 0, 0. 
the components of the second vector here, so 0, 1, 0, and now you calculate it. So you take i times the, this 2 by 2 determinant, that is 0, 0, 1, 0 times i. You subtract from that, so we'll go to j, the sine alternates to a minus, j times 1, 0, 0, 0 times j. And then you delete the row and column containing k, and come back to a plus, 1, 0, 0, 1 times k. This 2 by 2 determinant is 0. 0 times 0 minus 1 times 0. This 2 by 2 minute, 2 determinant is 0. 1 times 0 minus 0 times 0. Um, this one is the only non-zero one, and it's 1 times 1 minus 0 times 0. It's 1. So you just get k, as promised. And they're all that easy. i cross j is k. j cross k is i. K cross I is J. All right, well, that was too easy. Let's do an example that's not quite so easy. Let's calculate the cross product. calculate the cross product of 3, 1, 2 with minus 5, 0, 4. All right. Well, you know, it's, um, the cross product operation is a little messy, but you do what you do. It's not as though it's difficult. It's just a little cumbersome. We put i, j, and k across the top row. We put the components of, a, of the first vector here, 3, 1, 2. Components of the second vector here, minus 5, 0, 4. And then you just do this operation. It's, you look at i, you delete the row and column containing i, you get 1, 2, 0, 4. That's multiplied times i. And then you move to the j, the sign alternates to a minus. The remaining 2 by 2 determinant when you delete the row and column containing j is 3, 2, minus 5, 4, times j. The sign alternates back to a plus. You delete the row and column containing k. You get 3, 1, minus 5, 0 times k. And then you expand these determinants. And I'll get rid of the i, j, and k, but you could keep them if you like i, j, and k. But you get 4 minus 0. So you just get 4 times i, but I'll just put 4 in the first component. Then you get minus 3 times 4, so 12 minus minus 10, so plus 10. And then 3 times 0 minus, minus 5 times 1, so plus 5 here. So we get 4 minus 22, 5 as the cross product of those two vectors. It's not difficult. It's just a little cumbersome. What that 4 minus 22, 5 means is what I want to talk about. You know, you can define weird operations any way you want but there needs to be some value to calculating them. So what's the value of calculating the cross product? Um, before I can tell you this easily, I need to discuss one geometric, well, one geometric fact, geometric terminology, one geometric fact. Suppose I take a vector w and a vector v, if I start them at the same point, then they determine two sides of a parallelogram. So you could duplicate V up here right, and duplicate W over here. Right, this is also V because the vector doesn't know where it starts and where it stops. This parallelogram, or it's supposed to be a parallelogram, it's not very good. Um, we call this a parallelogram. Spanned by, or determined by, I like spanned by, spanned by B and W, spanned by W and V. It just means if you start those at the same point, they determine two sides of a parallelogram, and then you complete the parallelogram. If you look at this parallelogram, you could 
consider its area. If you call this angle theta, so the angle between V and W theta, and you drop this perpendicular, then this side has length, um, the magnitude of W, times the sine of theta. Well, that's the height of this parallelogram. And uh, the length of the base is the magnitude of V. So the area is the length of the base. So the area is the length of the base times the height, where theta is the angle between V and W. All right, so right, it's a parallelogram spanned by two vectors, and <clears throat> the area of that parallelogram is the magnitude of V times the magnitude W times the sine of the angle in between. Do not confuse this with the dot product. Um, this is, which would have cosine of theta there. The dot product of the vector V and W is the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times the cosine of the angle in between. All right. Now, I can state what's important and the important properties of the cross product. Two out of three of these are actually not hard to verify. They're a little ugly to verify, but they're not difficult to verify. So, theorem. Suppose V and W are vectors in R3. And theta is the angle between them. Um, if one of the vectors is a zero vector, there is no d angle. There are an infinite number of angles, but this won't be a problem. All of our statements will be trivial if one of the vectors is a, is a zero vector. So, um, A. The magnitude of the cross product is the length of V, to, uh, the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times the sine of the angle in between, which is the area. of the parallelogram. Span by V and W. So that's nice. Um, you may wonder how you show this. I'm not going to do it, but I'd like to give you an idea. How do you show that the magnitude of the cross product is that? Well, if you square both sides, that statement is equivalent to this squared equals this squared times magnitude of W squared times sine squared theta. But then you can replace sine squared by 1 minus cosine squared. But you can write out what cosine of theta is in terms of the dot product. And then what do you do? You verify that if you take what we actually calculated in terms of the components of E and W for the cross product, and you take the magnitude of that squared, and you, cal and you calculate that side, and you calculate this side, putting in for cosine theta what you get in terms of the dot product, you can just do the algebra and show that the two sides are equal. That's how you do it. I'm not going to do it. It's not terribly difficult, but it is a messy, lengthy calculation. Um, all right. What's the second big property of 
of the cross product. B, D cross W is perpendicular to both V and W. Oh, that's nice. Um, so it's a way of producing a vector that's perpendicular to two given vectors in R3. Um, why is that true? And, and again, this is easy. How do you tell if, easy but cumbersome, and I'm not going to do it. How do you tell if two vectors are perpendicular? You take their dot product and see if you get zero. So how do you verify that this is true? You take the expression for the cross product in terms of the components of V and W, and you dot it with V and make sure that you get zero. And you dot it with W and make sure you get zero. It's not difficult. Um, it's in the book. But it's a little messy to write down. Um, all right. If V is not the zero vector and W is not the zero vector, and they're not parallel to each other, um, and maybe I should come back here. How, could the cross product be zero? Cross product would be zero if, it, if and only if it's magnitude zero, which means one of these is zero or that's zero. So if neither of your original vectors is a zero vector, first of all, if one of your original vectors is the zero vector, the cross product is certainly zero. Um, but if neither one of them is zero, the only way the cross product is zero is if the sine of the angle between the vectors is zero, which means either the angle is zero or the angle is pi, which means the vectors are parallel. They either point in the same direction or opposite directions. So the only way for the cross product to be zero, the only ways are for one of the vectors to be zero or for the vectors to be parallel. Um, so if you assume the cross product is not zero, so the vectors are not the zero vectors and they're not parallel to each other, you'd have a, a vector v and a vector w. So you should picture these in R3. The cross product is perpendicular to both of them. So either the cross product goes up like this, or the cross product goes down like this. Right? It's perpendicular to both of those. So it's perpendicular to the plane spanned by those two, which determines its direction up to being that way or that way. We've already specified its magnitude, and this practically specifies its direction, but it doesn't quite. There are still two choices of direction, um, namely like that way or that way, perpendicular to both V and W. How do you decide? And this is the right-hand rule. Recall that we've talked about right-handed coordinate systems in section um, 1.1 or 1.2. We talked about them earlier. Um, this is the right-hand rule again. Assuming you're using a right-handed coordinate system, the direction is determined by the right-hand rule. And what does the right-hand rule say? If you point your index finger in the direction of the first vector in the cross product, and your middle finger in the direction of the second vector in the cross product, your thumb on your right hand points in the direction of the cross product. So that way, this is V cross W, not this. So, the direction of the cross product. And this is a hard property to verify. Is determined by B Uh, this is all, I should say, this is all assuming the cross product is not zero. So it's not the zero vector. So determined by B and the right hand rule. Which says. Let me not write it. 
I just stated it. It says if you point your index finger in the direction of the first vector, and your middle finger, it's on your right hand, index finger in the direction of the first vector, middle finger in the direction of the second vector, your thumb points in the direction of the cross product. So, all right. This completely determines the cross product. Um, the magnitude is the magnitude of that parallelogram. It's the magnitude of the two vectors, the magnitudes of the two vectors multiplied together times the sine of the angle between the vectors. This determines the direction up to plus or minus sine, and this determines the plus or minus sine. Um, what you should understand is what would change if we changed the order of v and w? If we took w cross v, then the magnitude wouldn't change. You'd get the magnitude of w times the magnitude of v times sine of the angle in between. Well, that's the same. This wouldn't change. We would, we would get w cross v is perpendicular to both v and w, or w and v, but this would change. If you take um, w cross v, then you would point your index finger in the direction of w, your middle finger in the direction of v, and your thumb would point in the opposite direction. So that w cross v points in the opposite direction. Or, alternatively, so what are we getting? We're, what I'm saying is it follows from these properties that w cross v is negative the vector v cross w. It points in the opposite direction. You can also do that by direct calculation, just in terms of the, matri the determinant of matrices definition of the cross product. If you just put the entries of W in the second row and the entries of V in the third row, instead of the entries of V in the second row and the entries of W in the third row, do this calculation, you'll see it negates. Um, I said that if two vectors are parallel, their cross product is zero. In particular, I, I want to emphasize that if you cross a vector with itself, well, certainly the vector is parallel to itself, you get the zero vector. This is very different from the dot product. First of all, the cross product, this is so important to remember, the cross product of two vectors is a vector, the dot product of two vectors is a scalar. The dot product of a vector with itself is the magnitude of the vector squared. The cross product of a vector with itself is zero, the zero vector. All right, so, um, what do I want to do for an example now? I would like to go back to our earlier calculation and say what it tells us. So, We calculated before, that, a few minutes ago, that 312 crossed with minus 504 is 4 minus 22, 5. Well, according to the theorem that I just stated, you ought to be able to interpret this in a couple of nice ways. So for one thing, this vector is supposed to be perpendicular to each of these. We'll check. I mean, it better be, or I've made a mistake somewhere. We ought to see that if we take 3, 1, 2, and dot with 4 minus 22, 5, that we get 0. That's how you check whether vectors are perpendicular, the easy way. So what do we get? We get this times this. You get 12 minus 22 plus 10. Yep. 12 plus 10, 22 minus 22, 0. Yes, those vectors are perpendicular. But the cross product is also, is also supposed to be perpendicular to the other vector, minus 5, 0, 4. So is it? Well, it better be, but we'll check. So you get minus 5 times 4, that's minus 20, plus 0 times minus 22, that's 0, plus 5 times 4, plus 20. Yep, minus 20 plus 20, 0. Yes. We verified our cross product. What we calculate for the cross product is perpendicular to each of the two original vectors. And the magnitude, the magnitude of that vector. So the magnitude of 4 minus 22, 5, which we could calculate, it's the square root of 4 squared plus negative 22 
squared plus 5 squared. Of what significance is that? Of what significance is that? This equals, I don't, I don't care what the number is, but the point is that that magnitude equals the area of the parallelogram. So in space, the area of the parallelogram spanned by the two vectors spanned by 3, 1, 2 and minus 5, 0, 4. Now, you know, can we see this? Well, we'd have to know this number. We'd have to draw those two vectors in three dimensions. We'd have to draw the parallelogram, and somehow we'd have to be able to eyeball the area of it. No, it's not something you can draw pictures of and verify easily, but it's true. Um, and that's why you care about the cross product. You calculate it because sometimes because you want a vector that's perpendicular to two given vectors, and sometimes because you want the area of the parallelogram spanned by the two vectors. Um, before I do another example, I should say something else, or you could. The cross product, it is not commutative. V cross W does not equal W cross V. In fact, this is called anti-commutivity. So this is anti-commutative. It is also not associative. So you may not remember what that means, but it means you can't just move parentheses around, even if you don't change the orders of things. So, for instance, so not associative. You need just to find one example where associativity fails, and it's easy to do. The easiest one I can think of was this. That this is unequal to i cross i cross j. Why? Well, you just calculate both sides. It's i cross i, well, as I emphasize, v cross v for any vector is 0. So this is a 0 vector. This is a 0 vector crossed with anything. This side's a 0 vector. What's this side? Well, i cross j is k. And earlier I told you what k cross i is. It's j. So this is negative k cross i. And that's negative j. If you don't want to have that memorized, you can just calculate it from scratch, that, or at least knowing i cross j is k, which we did verify. You can verify that i cross k is negative j. And negative j is not the zero vector. So no, the cross product is not associative either. However, it does distribute over addition, and you can pull out scalars. So it's called linear, or if you're talking about both factors at once, bilinear. So if you have um, something like u cross some a times b plus b times w, yes, you can distribute the cross product over the addition and pull out the scalar. So this is a times u cross v plus b times u cross w. And the same thing happens if you put this linear combination, so the scalars plus vectors in the first factor, and put the, the, uh, just a single vector here. A cross product distributes over addition, and you can pull out scalars. All right. Um, and how do you verify that? You, you just put it in the definition of cross product in terms of, of determinants and verify that it's true. It's not, like a lot of this stuff, it's not difficult to do. It's annoying, and it's cumbersome, but it's not difficult at all. I want to do two more problems, and I want to mention one physical application of the cross product. Um, so what's a, what's a standard problem with cross products? Well, how about, given three points in space that don't lie in a line, so three non-collinear points, how do you produce a standard equation for a plane containing those three points? So, suppose you've got three points in space. So here's a point A, here's a point B, here's a point C. 
I'm assuming they're not collinear. So. Hmm. There may be two L's in collinear. Um, it should be clear, kind of intuitively clear, that, oh, if they're not collinear, those three points determine a unique plane containing them. But how do you write down an equation for the plane? Well, you should know. To write down an equ a standard equation for a plane, you want two pieces of data. You want a point on the plane. Well, that's not a problem. We've got three of those. But you need a vector normal to the plane. How do you produce a vector normal to the plane? Well, now we have a way. Because what you do is you, you give a name to the dis one of the displacement vectors from, you pick one of your, your points, think of it as like the base point. Um, pick a vector, look at the displacement vector from your base point out to the other point, and another displacement vector. If your three points weren't collinear, these two vectors were not, will not be parallel. And so their cross product will be non-zero, and their cross product will produce a vector normal to the plane, which is what we need to write down a standard equation for the plane. We need a vector normal to the plane. So that's what we do. So let's take a specific example. Let's take A as the point 1, 0, 1. B is the point 2, 1, minus 1. And C is the point 0, 3, 0. If you do that, then this vector V that I've got drawn is the vector from B to A, uh, from A to B. So you take B and you subtract the components of A. So you get 1, 1, minus 2. 1, 1, minus 2. Uh, our vector W will be the vector from A to C. And so we take 0, 3, 0 and subtract 1, 0, 1, and get minus 1, 3, minus 1. And then we take the cross product of those two vectors to produce a normal vector to the plane. Then I'll use A as my point on the plane. I could use any of them. And write in a standard equation for the plane. So we need to take the cross product of those two vectors. That is what we'll use for a normal vector to the plane. So in our the normal vector that we're going to use, there are an infinite number of normal vectors, but the one we're going to use is the cross product of 1, 1, minus 2 with minus 1, 3, minus 1. So you just do the calculation. What do you get? Well, you get, you delete the row and column containing the i, you get 1 minus 2, 3 minus 1, that's times i. The sign alternates to a minus, you delete the row and column containing j, you get 1 minus 2, minus 1 minus 1 times j. Sign alternates back to a plus, you delete the row and column containing k. And so we get this times this, so minus 1 and then minus, minus minus 6. So we get minus 1 plus 6. Um, we get minus, then you get minus 1, and then minus, minus 1 times minus 2. So minus positive 2. And then you get... 1 times 3, so you get 3 minus, minus 1 times that, so plus 1. So I am getting 5. This is um, minus 3, but not, we get this minus sign out here, so plus 3, 4. So 5, 3, 4 is what I'm getting for the cross product. Um, so how do you write down um, a normal, uh, an equation for the plane in standard form? Now that we know a normal vector, 
a non-zero normal vector. We're all set. We've got n is 5, 3, 4. And I'll use the point A as my point on the plane. And then you should know how to immediately write down an equation for that plane. You use these components as coefficients. And then it's x minus that x coordinate. And then you get the 3 times y minus that y coordinate plus 4 times z minus that z coordinate, all equals 0. You get this for a standard equation for the plane. It's true you could multiply it out if you really wanted to write it as ax plus by plus cz plus d equals 0, but this is a nice form to leave it in. All right, let's do another example of how you can use um, cars. Ah, I see that I was leaving out part of this problem. What else might you be asked for in such a problem? And I, I had left out part of the problem. How about find the area of the triangle with these vertices? So the area of this triangle, how do you do that? Well, that's half the area of the parallelogram. So how do you find the area of that triangle? You take half the area of that parallelogram, but that parallelogram has area that's the magnitude of the cross product. So, but we already found the cross product of the vectors v and w. We found the magnitude of the vectors v and w, which were determined by the points a, b, and c. So you just take the area of the triangle is one half the, the magnitude of n. So it is one half the square root of 5 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared. Um, this is 25. This is 25. So the square root of 2 times 25, so if you want, it is 5 times the square root of 2 over 2 is the area of the triangle with those three vertices. So that's kind of cool. You find areas of triangles in space given the components. Another kind of standard use of, of the cross product. Suppose you had two planes. So, so another example. Consider the planes. Defined by x minus 1 plus 2 y minus 1 plus 2 times z minus 1 equals 0, and 2 times x minus 1 minus 3 times y minus 1 plus 4 times z minus 1 equals 0. And the, what's our problem? Parameterize the line of intersection of these two planes. And like the last problem, you should think about how to do this in general before you start plugging in our specific numbers. Like in the last problem, you see that you want to produce a normal vector. And you decide how you'll produce a normal vector given three points in space, a normal vector to the plane you're after. In this one, you should kind of draw your planes. Just kind of draw a couple of planes, although it is kind of hard to draw planes because I have so few features. but. Draw two planes intersecting, not like that, intersecting in space. 
I don't know why my plane is curving so much over here. Draw two planes intersecting in space and think about how would you produce a vector equation for this line? Well, it's like when we, in the last problem, when we had to produce a standard equation for a plane. Think about what you need for a, for a vector equation for a line. You need a point on the line and you need a vector parallel to the line. Well, how do you get a point on the line? You have to find a point of intersection of these two planes. But these, these were written in a nice form. You can immediately spot a point on each plane. It's 1, 1, 1. If you put in x, y, z is 1, 1, 1 here, and x, y, z is 1, 1, 1 here, they both, you get 0 both times. So 1, 1, 1 is on this line. So 1, 1, 1 is a point on the line. Now what do we need to do? We need to produce a vector parallel to the line. Well, that's where you're going to use cross products. Because if you take a normal vector to one of these planes, right, if you take a normal vector to one of these planes, well, that line is in that plane. So n1 has to be normal to that line. On the other hand, if you take a normal vector to the other plane, well, that line is in that plane too. So it has to be normal, so perpendicular to n2 also. That line is perpendicular to both normal vectors, the normal vectors to both planes. So you take the cross product of normal vectors to those planes. How do you produce normal vectors to the planes given to you in standard form? You read off the coefficients. So in one, you read off the coefficients. There's a one, a two, and a two. And in two, a normal vector this, you read off the coefficients. Two minus three, four. And then you take their cross product. We've done enough cross products now. I'm just going to let you do it. But you take their cross product and call their cross product D. And it doesn't matter which order because we don't care whether we get plus or minus B. Either way, we'll get a vector parallel to the line. You take their cross product. That's V. And then how do you parameterize this line? It's just X, Y, Z equals 1, 1, 1. The point you know is on the plane. Plus T times that vector V that's parallel to the line. And of course, you calculate what that B is. All right. Those are some uses of the cross product. Um, those are kind of geometric uses of areas of triangles, equations of planes, equations of the line. I do want to mention um, where cross product comes up um, uh, early in physics. There's a, this is kind of a fundamental physics use of cross product. I'm not going to do anything with it except define it, really. And that's torque. You've probably heard of torque. And you, pro and you may think that torque is a scalar quantity, just a number. In fact, torque is a vector. Um, typically, what happens is you have a point, and maybe you've got a rod that's that's fixed at this end. So maybe you know, this is nailed down somehow. And you've got this rod that goes from that point out to some other point. And of course, you can have the displacement vector that goes from x naught, y naught, z naught, to x1, y1, z1. But think of that as a metal rod that's, that can rotate about this point. This is nailed down, but this is free to rotate. Then you apply a force at this end. So there's some force that's being applied at this end of the rod. What is the torque by definition? Torque is the vector. It's not a scalar is the vector, and it's usually denoted with something that looks like a T, but we usually use the Greek form of that, so it's a tau. Torque is the vector, tau, and it is the displacement vector crossed with the force vector. Now, when, when we talk about torque as just a number, we mean the magnitude of the torque. 
Um, but this is what it is as a vector. I want to say a couple of things about this. So for one, if you're really trying to picture like, I don't, um, um, angles between the vectors, remember you should start with the vectors at the same point. So you should picture f as being over here, even though, when you're talking about the angle between them, even though you may be specifically talking about a force applied at this point. Um, so, um, but still the angle between the vectors is measured that way. So if you want to do it at this point, you would extend this line and theta is here. That's a nice way to look at it because then if you drop this perpendicular, then so to the line, what you're actually getting is that this component of the force has magnitude, the magnitude of F times the sine of theta. Okay. But what does that mean? Well, the magnitude of the torque vector, that's the magnitude of D cross F. And we've already discussed that that's the magnitude of D times the magnitude of F times the sine of the angle in between. But that's the magnitude of this component of the force, the normal component. So this is the magnitude of this normal component of the force. And so what you're getting is the magnitude of the, of the torque vector is the length of, if you're thinking of this as a rod, then the magnitude of D is the length of the rod. It's the length of the rod times the magnitude of the component of the force that's perpendicular to the, the rod. So that's a nice way of looking at it. The direction, um, well, the direction is determined by the right-hand rule. If you're really picturing this in the plane, then D, D, is, D is my index finger, D cross F. Um, F would be my middle finger, and tau would come straight out, out of the board at you. So the torque vector, if you're thinking of all this is in the plane in the blackboard, d, f, tau, right hand rule, the torque vector is coming straight out of you at the board, uh, straight out of the board at you. So it's coming this way. Um, but it's its magnitude that people usually refer to when they're talking about the torque, and that's just the length of the rod times the magnitude of the component of the force perpendicular to the rod. All right. That's the cross product. Be careful. The dot product of two vectors, this is the fundamental mistake that students make with dot product and cross product. The dot product of two vectors is a number. The cross product of two vectors is a vector.